Episode 17 Heretics by G. K. Chesterton Read by David Grizzly Smith Part 18. The Fallacy of the Young Nation To say that a man is an idealist is merely to say that he is a man. But, nevertheless, it might be possible to effect some valid distinction between one kind of idealist and another. One possible distinction, for instance, could be effected by saying that humanity is divided into conscious idealists and unconscious idealists. In a similar way, humanity is divided into conscious ritualists and unconscious ritualists. The curious thing is, in that example as in others, that it is the conscious ritualism which is comparatively simple, the unconscious ritual which is really heavy and complicated. The ritual which is comparatively rude and straightforward is the ritual which people call ritualistic. It consists of plain things like bread and wine and fire and men falling on their faces. But the ritual which is really complex and many-colored and elaborate and needlessly formal is the ritual which people enact without knowing it. It consists not of plain things like wine and fire, but of really peculiar, local, and exceptional, and ingenious things. Things like doormats, and door knockers, and electric bells, and silk hats, and white ties, and shiny cards, and confetti. The truth is that the modern man scarcely ever gets back to very old and simple things, except when he is performing some religious mummery. The modern man can hardly get away from ritual, except by entering a ritualistic church. In the case of these old and mystical formalities, we can at least say that the ritual is not mere ritual, that the symbols employed are, in most cases, symbols which belong to a primary human poetry. The most ferocious opponent of the Christian ceremonials must admit that if Catholicism had not instituted the bread and wine, somebody else would most probably have done so. Anyone with a poetical instinct will admit to the ordinary human instinct bread symbolizes something, which cannot very easily be symbolized otherwise. That wine, to the ordinary human instinct, symbolizes something which cannot very easily be symbolized otherwise. But white ties in the evening are ritual, and nothing else but ritual. No one would pretend that white ties in the evening are primary and poetical. Nobody would maintain that the ordinary human instinct would in any age or country tend to symbolize the idea of evening by a white necktie. Rather, the ordinary human instinct would, I imagine, tend to symbolize evening by cravats with some of the colors of the sunset. Not white neckties, but tawny or crimson neckties, neckties of purple or olive or some darkened gold. Mr. J. A. Kensett, for example, is under the impression that he is not a ritualist. But the daily life of Mr. J. A. Kensett, like that of any ordinary modern man, is, as a matter of fact, one continual and compressed catalogue of mystical mummery and flummery. To take one instance out of an inevitable hundred, I imagine that Mr. Kensett takes off his hat to a lady. And what can be more solemn and absurd, considered in the abstract, than symbolizing the existence of the other sex by taking off a portion of your clothing and waving it in the air? This is, I repeat, not a natural and primitive symbol like fire or food. A man might just as well have to take off his waistcoat to a lady. And if a man, by the social ritual of his civilization, had to take off his waistcoat to a lady, every chivalrous and sensible man would take off his waistcoat to a lady. In short, 
Mr. Kensett, and those who agree with him, may think, and quite sincerely think, that men give too much incense and ceremonial to their adoration of the other world. But nobody thinks that he can give too much incense and ceremonial to the adoration of this world. All men, then, are ritualists, but are either conscious or unconscious ritualists. The conscious ritualists are generally satisfied with a few very simple and elementary signs. The unconscious ritualists are not satisfied with anything short of the whole of human life being almost insanely ritualistic. The first is called a ritualist because he invents and remembers one right. The other is called an anti-ritualist because he obeys and forgets a thousand. And a somewhat similar distinction to this, which I have drawn with some unavoidable length between the conscious ritualist and the unconscious ritualist, exists between the conscious idealist and the unconscious idealist. It is idle to inveigh against cynics and materialists. There are no cynics. There are no materialists. Every man is idealistic. Only it so often happens that he has the wrong ideal. Every man is incurably sentimental. But unfortunately, it is so often a false sentiment. When we talk, for instance, of some unscrupulous commercial figure and say that he would do anything for money, we use quite an inaccurate expression, and we slander him very much. He would not do anything for money. He would do some things for money. He would sell his soul for money, for instance. And, as Mirabeau humorously said, he would be quite wise to take money for muck. He would oppress humanity for money. But then it happens that humanity and the soul are not things that he believes in. They are not his ideals. But he has his own dim and delicate ideals, and he would not violate these for money. He would not drink out of the soup tureen for money. He would not wear his coattails in front for money. He would not spread a report that he had softening of the brain for money. In the actual practice of life, we find in the matter of ideals exactly what we have already found in the matter of ritual. We find that while there is a perfectly genuine danger of fanaticism from the men who have unworldly ideals, the permanent and urgent danger of fanaticism is from the men who have worldly ideals. Now, people who say that an ideal is a dangerous thing that it deludes and intoxicates, are perfectly right. But the ideal which intoxicates most is the least idealistic kind of ideal. The ideal which intoxicates least is the very ideal ideal that sobers us suddenly, as all heights and precipices and great distances do. Granted, that it is a great evil to mistake a cloud for a cape. Still, the cloud, which can be most easily mistaken for a cape, is the cloud that is nearest the earth. Similarly, we may grant that it may be dangerous to mistake an ideal for something practical. But we shall still point out that, in this respect, the most dangerous ideal of all is the ideal which looks a little practical. It is difficult to attain a high ideal. Consequently, it is almost impossible to persuade ourselves that we have attained it. But it is easy to attain a low ideal. Consequently, it is easier still to persuade ourselves that we have attained it when we have done nothing of the kind. To take a random example, it might be called a high ambition to wish to be an archangel. The man who entertained such an ideal would very possibly exhibit asceticism or even frenzy, but not, I think, delusion. He would not think he was an archangel and go about flapping his hands under the impression that they were wings. But suppose that a sane man had a low ideal. Suppose he wished to be a gentleman. 
Anyone who knows the world knows that in nine weeks he would have persuaded himself that he was a gentleman. And this being manifestly not the case, the result will be very real and practical dislocations and calamities in social life. It is not the wild ideals which wreck the practical world. It is the tame ideals. The matter may, perhaps, be illustrated by a parallel from our modern politics. When men tell us that the old liberal politicians of the type of Gladstone cared only for ideals, of course they are talking nonsense. They cared for a great many other things, including votes. And when men tell us that modern politicians of the type of Mr. Chamberlain, or in another way, Lord Roseberry, care only for votes or for the material interest, then again they are talking nonsense. These men care for ideals, like all other men. But the real distinction which may be drawn is this, that to the older politician the ideal was an ideal, and nothing else. To the new politician, his dream is not only a good dream, it is a reality. The old politician would have said, it would be a good thing if there were a Republican Federation dominating the world. But the modern politician does not say, it would be a good thing if there were British imperialism dominating the world. He says, it is a good thing that there is a British imperialism dominating the world. Whereas, clearly, there is nothing of the kind. The old liberal would say, there ought to be a good Irish government in Ireland. But the ordinary modern unionist does not say there ought to be a good English government in Ireland. He says there is a good English government in Ireland, which is absurd. In short, the modern politicians seem to think that a man becomes practical merely by making assertions entirely about practical things. Apparently, a delusion does not matter as long as it is a materialistic delusion. Instinctively, most of us feel that as a practical matter, even the contrary is true. I certainly would much rather share my apartments with a gentleman who thought he was God than with a gentleman who thought he was a grasshopper. To be continually haunted by practical images and practical problems, to be constantly thinking of things as actual, as urgent, as in process of completion, these things do not prove a man to be practical. These things, indeed, are among the most ordinary signs of a lunatic. That our modern statesmen are materialistic is nothing against their being also morbid. Seeing angels in a vision may make a man a supernaturalist to excess, but merely seeing snakes in delirium tremens does not make him a naturalist. And when we come actually to examine the main stock notions of our modern practical politicians, we find that those main stock notions are mainly delusions. A great many instances might be given of the fact. We might take, for example, the case of that strange class of notions which underlie the word union, and all the eulogies heaped upon it. Of course, union is no more a good thing in itself than separation is a good thing in itself. To have a party in favor of union and a party in favor of separation is as absurd as to have a party in favor of going upstairs and a party in favor of going downstairs. The question is not whether we go up or downstairs, but where are we going to? And what are we going for? Union is strength. Union is also weakness. It is a good thing to harness two horses to a cart. But it is not a good thing to try to turn two handsome cabs into one four-wheeler. Turning ten nations into one empire may happen to be as feasible as turning ten shillings into one half-sovereign. Also, it may happen to be as preposterous as turning ten terriers into one mastiff. The question, in all cases, is not a question of union or absence of union, but identity or absence of identity. 
Owing to certain historical and moral causes, two nations may be so united as upon the whole to help each other. Thus England and Scotland pass their time in paying each other compliments, but their energies and atmospheres run distinct and parallel, and consequently do not clash. Scotland continues to be educated and Calvinistic. England continues to be uneducated and happy. But owing to certain other moral and certain other political causes, two nations may be so united as only to hamper each other. Their lines do clash and do not run parallel. Thus, for instance, England and Ireland are so united that the Irish can sometimes rule England, but can never rule Ireland. The educational systems, including the last Education Act, are here, as in the case of Scotland, a very good test of the matter. The overwhelming majority of Irishmen believe in a strict Catholicism. The overwhelming majority of Englishmen believe in a vague Protestantism. The Irish party in Parliament of Union is just large enough to prevent the English education being indefinitely Protestant, and just small enough to prevent the Irish education being definitely Catholic. Here we have a state of things which no man in his senses would ever dream of wishing to continue if he had not been bewitched by the sentimentalism of the mere word union. This example of union, however, is not the example which I propose to take of the ingrained futility and deception underlying all the assumptions of the modern practical politician. I wish to speak, especially, of another and much more general delusion. It pervades the minds and speeches of all the practical men of all parties, and it is a childish blunder built upon a single false metaphor. I refer to the universal modern talk about young nations and new nations, about America being young, about New Zealand being new. The whole thing is a trick of words. America is not young, and New Zealand is not new. It is a very discussable question whether they are not both much older than England or Ireland. Of course, we may use the metaphor of youth about America or the colonies if we use it strictly as implying only a recent origin. But if we use it as we do use it, as implying bigger, or vivacity, or crudity, or inexperience, or hope, or a long life before them, or any of the romantic attributes of youth, then it is surely as clear as daylight that we are duped by a stale figure of speech. We can easily see the matter clearly by applying it to any other institution parallel to the institution of an independent nationality. If a club called the Milk and Soda League, let us say, was set up yesterday, as I have no doubt it was, then, of course, the Milk and Soda League is a young club, in the sense that it was set up yesterday, but in no other sense. It may consist entirely of moribund old gentlemen. It may be moribund itself. We may call it a young club in light of the fact that it was founded yesterday, we may also call it a very old club in the light of the fact that it will most probably go bankrupt tomorrow. All this appears very obvious when we put it in this form. Anyone who adopted the young community delusion with regards to a bank or a butcher's shop would be sent to an asylum. But the whole modern political notion that America and the other colonies must be very vigorous because they are very new rests upon no better foundation. That America was founded long after England does not make it even in the faintest degree more probable that America will not perish a long time before England. That England existed before her colonies does not make it any less likely that she will exist after her colonies. And when we look at the actual history of the world, we find that great European nations almost invariably have survived the vitality of their colonies. When we look at the actual history of the world, we find that if there is a thing that is born old and dies young, it is a colony. The Greek colonies, 
went to pieces long before the Greek civilization. The Spanish colonies have gone to pieces long before the nation of Spain. Nor does there seem to be any reason to doubt the possibility or even the probability of the conclusion that the colonial civilization, which owes its origin to England, will be much briefer and much less vigorous than the civilization of England itself. The English nation will still be going the way of all European nations, when the Anglo-Saxon race has gone the way of all fads. Now, of course, the interesting question is, have we, in the case of America and the colonies, any real evidence of a moral and intellectual youth, as opposed to the indisputable triviality of a merely chronological youth? Consciously or unconsciously, we know that we have no such evidence, and consciously or unconsciously, therefore, we proceed to make it up. Of this pure and placid invention, a good example, for instance, can be found in a recent poem of Mr. Rudyard Kipling's. Speaking of the English people in the South African War, Mr. Kipling says that we fawned on the younger nations for the men that could shoot and ride. But some people consider this sentence insulting. All that I am concerned with at present is the evident fact that it is not true. The colonies provided very useful volunteer troops, but they did not provide the best troops, nor achieve the most successful exploits. The best work in the war on the English side was done, as might have been expected, by the best English regiments. The men who could shoot and ride were not the enthusiastic corn merchants from Melbourne, any more than they were the enthusiastic clerks from Cheapside. The men who could shoot and ride were the men who had been taught to shoot and ride in the discipline of the standing army of a great European power. Now, of course, the colonials are as brave and athletic as any other average white men. Of course, they acquitted themselves with reasonable credit. All I have here to indicate is that, for the purposes of this theory of the new nation, it is necessary to maintain that the colonial forces were more useful or more heroic than the gunners at Colenso or the Fighting Fifth. And of this contention, there is not, and never has been, one stick or straw of evidence. A similar attempt is made and with even less success, to represent the literature of the colonies as something fresh and vigorous and important. The imperialist magazines are constantly springing upon us some genius from Queensland or Canada, through whom we are expected to smell the odors of the bush or the prairie. As a matter of fact, anyone who is even slightly interested in literature as such, and I for one confess that I am only slightly interested in literature as such, will freely admit that the stories of these geniuses smell of nothing but printer's ink, and that not of first-rate quality. By a great effort of imperial imagination, the generous English people reads into these works a force and a novelty, but the force and the novelty are not in the new writers. The force and the novelty are in the ancient heart of the English. Anybody who studies them impartially will know that the first-rate writers of the colonies are not even particularly novel in their note and atmosphere, are not only not producing a new kind of good literature, but are not even in any particular sense producing a new kind of bad literature. The first-rate writers of the new countries are really almost exactly like the second-rate writers of the old countries. Of course, they do feel the mystery of the wilderness, the mystery of the bush, for all simple and honest men feel this in Melbourne or Margate or South St. Pancras. But when they write most sincerely and most successfully, it is not with a background of the mystery of the bush, but with a background, expressed or assumed, of our own romantic cockney civilization. What really moves their souls with a kindly terror is not the mystery of the wilderness, but the mystery of a handsome cab. Of course, there are some exceptions to this generalization. The one really arresting exception is Olive Schreiner, and she is quite as certainly an exception that proves the rule. 
Olive Schreiner is a fierce, brilliant, and realistic novelist, but she is all this precisely because she is not English at all. Her tribal kinship is with the country of ten years and Martin Martins, that is, with the country of realists. Her literary kinship is with the pessimistic fiction of the continent, with the novels whose very pity is cruel. Olive Schreiner is the one English colonial who is not conventional, for the very simple reason that South Africa is the one English colony which is not English, and probably never will be. And, of course, there are individual exceptions in a minor way. I remember in particular some Australian tales by Mr. McElwain, which were really able and effective, and which, for that reason, I suppose, are not presented to the public with blasts of a trumpet. But my general contention, if put before anyone with a love of letters, will not be disputed, if it is understood. It is not the truth that the colonial civilization as a whole is giving us, or shows any signs of giving us, a literature which will startle and renovate our own. It may be a very good thing for us to have an affectionate illusion in the matter. That is quite another affair. The colonies may have given England a new emotion. I only say that they have not given the world a new book. Uh, touching upon these English colonies, I do not wish to be misunderstood. I do not say of them or of America that they have not a future or that they will not be great nations. I merely deny the whole established modern expression about them. I deny that they are destined to a future. I deny that they are destined to be great nations. I deny, of course, that any human thing is destined to be anything. All the absurd physical metaphors, such as youth and age, living and dying, are, when applied to nations, but pseudo-scientific attempts to conceal from men the awful liberty of their lonely souls. In the case of America, indeed, a warning to this effect is instant and essential. America, of course, like every other human thing, can, in a spiritual sense, live or die as much as it chooses. But at the present moment, the matter which America has very seriously to consider is not how near it is to its birth and beginning, but how near it may be to its end. It is only a verbal question whether American civilization is young. It may become a very practical and urgent question whether it is dying. When we once have cast aside, as we inevitably have after a moment's thought, the fanciful physical metaphor involved in the word youth, what serious evidence have we that America is a fresh force and not a stale one? It has a great many people, like China. It has a great deal of money, like defeated Carthage or dying Venice. It is full of bustle and excitability, like Athens after its ruin, and all the Greek cities in their decline. It is fond of new things, but the old are always fond of new things. Young men read chronicles, but old men read newspapers. It admires strength and good looks. It admires a big and barbaric beauty in its women, for instance. But so did Rome when the Goth was at the gates. All these are things quite compatible with fundamental tedium and decay. There are three main shapes or symbols in which a nation can show itself essentially glad and great. By the heroic in government, by the heroic in arms, and by the heroic in art. Beyond government, which is, as it were, the very shape and body of a nation, the most significant thing about any citizen is his artistic attitude towards a holiday and his moral attitude towards a fight. That is, his way of accepting life and his way of accepting death. Subjected to these eternal tests, 
America does not appear by any means as particularly fresh or untouched. She appears with all the weakness and weariness of modern England or of any other Western power. In her politics she has broken up exactly, as England has broken up, into a bewildering opportunism and insincerity. In the matter of war and the national attitude towards war, her resemblance to England is even more manifest and melancholy. It may be said with rough accuracy that there are three stages in the life of a strong people. First, it is a small power and fights small powers. Then it is a great power and fights great powers. Then it is a great power and fights small powers, but pretends they are great powers, in order to rekindle the ashes of its ancient emotion and vanity. After that, the next step is to become a small power itself. England exhibited this symptom of decadence very badly in the war with the Transvaal. But America exhibited it worse in the war with Spain. There was exhibited more sharply and absurdly than anywhere else the ironic contrast between the very careless choice of a strong line and the very careful choice of a weak enemy. America added to all her other late Roman or Byzantine elements the element of the Caracalian triumph, the triumph over nobody. But when we come to the last test of nationality, the test of art and letters, the case is almost terrible. The English colonies have produced no great artists, and that fact may prove that they are still full of silent possibilities and reserve force, but America has produced great artists. And that fact most certainly proves that she is full of a fine futility and the end of all things. Whatever the American men of genius are, they are not young gods making a young world. Is the art of Whistler a brave, barbaric art, happy and headlong? Does Mr. Henry James infect us with the spirit of a schoolboy? No. The colonies have not spoken, and they are safe. Their silence may be the silence of the unborn, but out of America has come a sweet and startling cry, as unmistakable as the cry of a dying man. Thank you for listening to Heretics, written by G.K. Chesterton in about 1905, read by David Grizzly Smith in about 2009. Theme music for this book is Faxted, written by Gustav Holtz in 1921, arranged by Kevin MacLeod in 2006. This recording is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 License. Your comments are appreciated. And please share this recording with your friends. But share the whole recording, don't sell it, and tell people where you found it and who created it. Thank you.